Okay, uh, this is uh, WAP Chapter 13 uh, lecture. Uh, this focuses on the Byzantine Empire, which is basically the remnants of the, the Roman Empire in the East, whereas the West Roman Empire had fallen uh, in the East, it had remained. Okay, uh, it was more politically and culturally fragmented in the old Roman Empire. Remember, the Roman Empire was this huge, sprawling mass, culturally pretty much the same. The Byzantine Empire never really gets to that level, uh, but it is a juggernaut. Uh, it was a powerhouse. It helped influence the history of the Slavs and uh, Eastern Europe in particular, uh, especially Russia. Uh, it was Constantinople, its capital, uh, occupies this just perfect position that allows it to control the trade from the Black Sea, which is Eastern Europe and, and Russia, and the Mediterranean as well. Um, this new capital allowed Constantinople, uh, Constantine to better uh, control all the trade in the area. It also allowed them to keep a, a better eye on the Sassanid Empire, uh, which was growing in power there in Persia. Uh, the Byzantines faced different challenges, of course, than the Roman Empires did. Uh, they faced a powerful Sassanid dynasty. Uh, they faced these constant invasions from nomadic peoples from Central Asia, from the north and the east. Um, and it's a time period where the Sassanids are trying to gain all, regain all of the empire uh, that the Persians had owned under the Achaemenid Empire, if you remember the one that Alexander had conquered. So they're trying to get all that land back, and much of that land is Byzantine land. Um, it, the Byzantine Empire was highly centralized, uh, ruled through the emperor. Uh, Constantine himself claimed divine favor. He wasn't divine. He was a Christian, so he couldn't believe that he was divine, but he did claim divine favor, uh, and he ruled over the Christian church. That's a very big difference in uh, the Byzantine Empire is that there's never a separation of church and state. The, the Caesaropapism that goes on, the fact that uh, the head of the church, more so than the patriarch, is actually the emperor of the Byzantines. Um, after the 6th century, the Byzantine emperors became absolute rulers, meaning they, they checked with nobody and they could do pretty much whatever they want. Uh, they were so powerful that even the high officials would present themselves to the, the emperors uh, as slaves. They would prostrate themselves, kiss the hands and feet of the emperor, uh, and these are the highest of the high. Uh, so almost a divinity uh, to the Byzantine empires, emperors themselves. Uh, without a doubt, the most important of the Byzantine emperors was the Emperor Justin, uh, Justinian. He and his wife Theodora uh, really remade the empire, expanded its borders, uh, and made it incredibly powerful. And we'll talk, they've got a great, interesting story. Uh, both of them are born with humble origins. Uh, he edu he's a self-made man. He's edu he educates himself and kind of rises through the ranks. She's a striptease artist that he... Uh, he falls in love with, but she's got this clever, clever mind, and she's really, uh, really helps drive him and, and keep him uh, going in the right direction. Um, his most important political contribution uh, was the Justinian Code, uh, which just took those old Roman laws and, and kind of <clears throat> got rid of the ones that didn't make any sense, kind of updated them, uh, and it really uh, helps the Byzantine Empire. Um, his most ambitious effort was to uh, try to reclaim all the old Roman lands in the West. Uh, and he did get most of those back, but uh, soon after his death, those lands would fall to the Germanic peoples again. Uh, so really, just kind of a waste of resources, if you will. He had to really heavily tax the people. Uh, as such, there, were, uh, there was a significant rebellion at one point uh, under his reign that he had to have his... Uh, his best general, Belisarius, put down. He slaughtered like 30,000 people. Uh, pretty pretty intense there. Um, after the 7th century, Islam uh, posed a very significant threat to the Byzantine Empire uh, because the Arabs had overcome the Sassanids and uh, they were just a, a military powerhouse really sweeping throughout uh, the Middle East. Uh, and the Byzantine Empire itself was much smaller than the old Roman Empire and it was more manageable than the Roman Empire was. And they were really able to keep the Arabs at bay because of uh, their superior technology, things like Greek fire, um, this potent mixture that would burn on water. Uh, and pretty much when it got on you, you couldn't stop drop and roll to put it out. It was, it was pretty much going to burn you up. Uh, so it was uh, pretty terrible. <clears throat> uh, the Byzantine Empire was reorganized under a system called the Theme System, uh, which basically... Um, 
it's kind of like the satraps of Persia. It was put, but instead of governor, it was put under the uh, leadership of a general. The generals were uh, closely watched so that you didn't have decentralization going on. You didn't have them uh, trying to grab power. However, we'll see later on that those generals would um, really cause some problems a couple hundred years down the road. Um, these generals would recruit their soldiers uh, from the free peasants. Uh, the, the free peasants really drove the military of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, you know, you were given land for service. So if, if you served in the Byzantine military, then uh, you were granted land when you got back because you were a free peasant. So it was a pretty good system uh, that worked well for a long time. Um, what you see in this time period also um, is Byz the Byzantines becoming very powerful under uh, Basil the Bulgar Slayer. Uh, whose reign uh, was known for conquering the Bulgars, uh, which were a um, invading group of people. Uh, he was able to take them out in warfare. Uh, there was a lot of ecclesiastical issues in the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, ecclesiastical meaning church-related uh, issues. Um, there was Greek-speaking. It had Greek influences because uh, they were centered very close to Greece. Um, the Caesar of Papism was always a huge deal. Uh, it really strained their relationship with Western Europe. You had the Pope uh, and the Western uh, half of the empire that believes one thing, and you're going to see that the uh, that the Byzantine Orthodox Church is going to believe something a little bit different. All right, next we're going to move on to focus a little bit on their economy and society. Uh, they dominated the Med Mediterranean trade because of their strong economy. Uh, they had surplus agriculture which allowed them to be a trading juggernaut, uh, huge amounts of trade, and tons of craft workers. Um, it, it was the strongest when the empire supported a large class of free peasants uh, owning small plots of land. That really helped drive the empire's economy. Now, the theme system uh, strengthened free peasantry by making land available uh, to those who served in the military. We kind of talked about that. Uh, the taxes come mostly from these small land hold landholders. Uh, but they can afford to pay these taxes because they do own land. Um, now, large landowners would actually raise the military forces, uh, but usually they only did this to advance their own interests, and they really start working against the policies of the central government, and it hurt the empire in the last 300 years or so of its existence. Um, industry and trade in the Byzantine Empire... Uh, Constantinople is incredibly important because of its location. Uh, it enjoys this great reputation for uh, fantastic glassware. They've got the best glass uh, anywhere out there. Mirrors, windows, uh, linen, wool textiles, gems, uh, fine work in gold and silver. They're known for all these things. Uh, they eventually smuggle in uh, silk and uh, start producing silk that's traded out to the uh, uh, to Western Europe. Uh, they dominate trade so, so much that uh, their gold coin was the common currency throughout the Mediterranean for roughly 600 years. Uh, they, they dominated so much. They drew enormous wealth from their trade and uh, from levying of duties. They made money off of people wanting to trade to the Western European. They just put a tax on goods going through their ports, and they make money off of that because their location is so fantastically placed. Um, banks, they, they really had really great banks. They didn't invent banks. Uh, but their banks were fantastic. They gave loan to traders who really probably shouldn't even have got loans, but that helped uh, people invest in trade and helped it keep going. Um, urban life, as far as <coughs> the Byzantines are concerned, there is no other city to match Constantinople. They, the people even refer to it as the city. Uh, there's no rival. It, it's so far above and beyond everything else that's in the Byzantine city. Uh, women in the Byzantine Empire... They were veiled. We think of the Muslims as, as these, you know, women in veils. They really got that from the Byzantines. Uh, the women weren't allowed to uh, uh, take on like, you know, private conversations with men and stuff. They were, you know, we didn't. They didn't want them tempted to do bad things. Uh, they had all kinds of entertainment in the city. Uh, the most they had the bathhouses like the Romans. They considered themselves Romans. They called themselves Romans. Um, so they had those things. And uh, probably the most famous uh, favorite thing for people to watch was the chariot races at the Hippodrome. Uh, Hippodrome 
roughly 10,000 more people than the Colosseum held. It was even bigger and a little more spectacular than uh, the the Roman Colosseum was. Uh, the the, um, the chariot races was kind of like fanatical soccer stuff going on. There You had two rival gangs, basically, the Greens and the Blues. And uh, once upon a time, they even uh, had this huge uprising um, in Justinian's time, and, and they get put down by Belisarius. And after that, the Greens and Blues, actually the leaders of the Greens and Blues, would actually turn out to be uh, working imperial jobs and, and would do good things. Um, Orthodox Christianity in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, after the 6th century, uh, the Greeks became... Uh, uh, the Greeks start looking more and more, the Greek-speaking people start looking more and more to uh, uh, the Greeks, their foundational heritage with the Greeks. Uh, this Byzantine bureaucracy calls for a huge amount of educated peoples. The kids are having to uh, to be educated, read and write, and things uh, that you need for running a bureaucracy. Uh, almost all of our classical Greek, your Sophocles, and, and all the things that we know from the Greeks, from so uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, survive because the Byzantines copied them in the 12th century. Uh, so if it wouldn't have been for that, a lot of that stuff would have been lost to history. Um, the, uh, the Byzantine church, uh, very distinctive uh, because of the very, very super close relationship between uh, the emperor and uh, the church itself. Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea, uh, where he rules on these, this Christian group called the Arians, basically. Uh, and their view was that Jesus was human. Constantine comes in and says, mm, no, he's divine, uh, but he was a mortal human also. And this kind of complex, twisted relationship becomes the orthodox view. The Arians are, are condemned as heretics and basically ran out of town and, and killed. Um, the emperor would actually appoint the patriarchs, uh, not the church itself. So he had too much control over the church, and it, it's always kind of a big problem. Uh, Caesar of Papism, constant uh, source of conflict between church and state. Uh, the most divisive policy, however, was put in under uh, Leo III, and that was iconoclasm. And that's when you had all these great paintings of the saints and Jesus and stuff, and they inspired the people to worship. Uh, Leo felt that this was like kind of like uh, idol worship and that it was a sin. And so he, he started burning those paintings and getting rid of them. And, and the people really, really hated this. Uh, and, and the people in West... Well, in the western half of the empire, the old Roman Empire hated this because this was fine in their religion. Uh, so there was this helped make a split between uh, the west and eastern church. Um, the people start looking at local monasteries for inspiration in this time period. Uh, since you know they kind of the, they want the state out of their business, the monasteries are a little bit different in the Byzantine Empire. Saint Basil, who's the patriarch at one time, is kind of the he kind of gets these monasteries reformed and and following guidelines and stuff. Uh, but they never serve as the educational centers that you see Buddhist uh, monasteries and some others uh, serving as. Uh, they did do a lot of uh, humanitarian things though. They provided medicine. They provided uh, a food to local peoples. Uh, the tensions basically uh, would lead to a, a split in the church after 1054 when the patriarch and the, and the, uh, uh, the Roman pope excommunicate each other. So by then the, the churches are two split things, Roman Catholicism and the Orthodox Church. Uh, the Byzantines uh, enter decline in the late 11th century due to mostly due to pressure from Western Europe and the huge Islamic pressure. Um, however, they did have enormous influence with the Slavs, uh, especially the Russian Slavs, who would adopt their religion under Prince Vladimir, uh, would adopt Orthodox Christianity. And so even after, um, even after the Byzantines fall in the, in the mid-1400s, uh, their influence would continue on through the Russian Empire.